You may be too young to remember that when John F. Kennedy was in office in one of his speeches, I don't think it was his, for his inaugural, but I think it was shortly thereafter, um, he told a story about his grandfather and how his grandfather, when he was young, a young boy in Ireland, uh, he and his friends would run across the fields of Ireland and there'd be walls. And every time they got to a wall that was too high to get over, they would throw their caps over the wall. And then they knew they had to get over the wall or their mothers would kill them. So they would get over the wall and get going. And so when I committed to do a live chat <laughs> um, 45 minutes ago, that's what I was doing, throwing my hat over the wall. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing any um, questions or thoughts uh, on the live chat as I'm looking at it. Uh, but it appears to be functioning, so please uh, feel free to say hello or uh, anything at all so that I can see that the, la the live chat system is working on this effort. <clears throat> um, I'm prepared to stay here and answer questions or talk about whatever you want to talk about. But the only way you're going to be able to communicate with me is through the live chat system. And uh, so I hope you'll say something or wave or whatever it is <laughs> to let me know that you're um, hearing um, what I'm doing. It appears that we have seven people on here, so that's uh, quite encouraging. Ah, okay, Daniel Bona has uh, put something on. Terrific. Um, <sighs> Daniel, Daniel Bona asks if I will ever do a series on Jung's Mysterium Conjunctionis. And the answer to that is yes, I have that intention. Um, I have a few other things <laughs> ahead of it in the line right now uh, because I found that uh, the Red Book turned out to be very popular on the YouTube channel. And so I've started to read more of the Red Book, uh, but I have a, a physical constraint that I'm learning about, which is um, uh, I find that when I'm reading some of Jung's depth work, that it literally causes me to self-hypnotize and it puts me to sleep. And so it's not putting me to sleep because it's boring me. It's putting me to sleep in a hypnotic kind of way. And so all of a sudden I'll find a video that I'm editing to put online here. I'll go, oh. <laughs> and uh, so I was having that experience with the Red Book yesterday. But I've done um, a couple of more sections on the Red Book. And uh, I probably will do the rest of Ion and the Red Book before I get to Mysterium Conjunctionis. But um, meanwhile, there is uh, a excellent Edinger lecture series on Mysterium. And so you don't need to wait for me. You can just go to Amazon or whoever and uh, find uh, Mysterium Conjunctionis if you're game. And I highly recommend that you read uh, the psychological papers and psychology and alchemy. Um, I'm sorry, it's the um, it's the alchemical papers and psychology and alchemy before you get into Mysterium, unless you're already well aware of it. Um, and so anyway, Edinger did a lecture series on Mysterium Conjunctionis, and you can get that either through Amazon, I presume, or you could do everyone a favor uh, and buy it from Inner City Books. Uh, it's a 
publisher in Toronto, but uh, Inner City Books has published all of Dr. Edinger's work uh, first, and it was a labor of love for many years, and so it would be very helpful to the Jungian community, especially to us non-Jungian analysts, if you would so support Inner City Books. Um, Um, thank you, uh, Samuel, for your comment. And hello, Colin. It's great to have you here. Uh, Colin Georgieff has, uh, has been following the YouTube channel uh, for many months, and he and I have had a few Skype chats uh, over those months, and yeah, it's been a tremendous blessing for both him and me, I think. And so it's nice to see you here, Colin. Um, <laughs> Jonathan Cabral <laughs> says he goes to, li goes to sleep listening to my channel. Oh, well, that's fair enough. <laughs> if I can, prov if I can provide a soporific for anybody, uh, I really am happy about that because I have a tremendous difficulty sleeping myself. <laughs> But um, but I'm glad that I'm glad that you found some use for my time. <laughs> um, and uh, Ada says, "Can I recommend any book or paper for women on integration or personality development?" Um, and I think that I have on my shelf here a book that might answer that question. Hold on just a minute. Ah, uh, yes, I do have it. Uh, it's called um, The Way of All Women uh, by Dr. Edith Harding. And Dr. Harding was uh, one of the first generation Jungian students and I have not read this book. This is, this is a book that may be out of print. I got it from uh, used books on Amazon, so you may be able to get it there. Uh, the other book that I got from Amazon from Edith Harding is Psychic Energy, and I urge you all to read that book, but especially, uh, I think, The Way of All Women uh, is addressed to women, and so I would highly recommend trying to find that on Amazon and uh, taking a look at that. Uh, there's another book uh, by uh, Dr. Eric Neumann. Dr. Neumann was another of uh, Jung's closest disciples in the first generation, and uh, he wrote many books, The Archetype of the Child, but one of the big books that he wrote was The Great Mother Archetype. And so I urge you to uh, look that up. Um, so let me just put these here in the, in the comments. So I'm recommending um, Edith Harding, uh, The Way of All Women, and Dr. Eric uh, Neumann, Edith Harding, Dr. Um, the Great mother. Um, and Neumann's book may be called um, The Great Mother Archetype. I'm not sure if that's in the title, but in any case, those are the, those are the two books that might be useful on that. Uh, also, um, a very important book for women is um, Women Who Run With Wolves. Uh, 
Uh, it's now uh, about 25 years old, but um, Clarissa Pincola Esti, she's a Jungian analyst in um, Colorado, wrote that, and it was on the bestseller list for a couple of years, and it's an excellent book, and you may have heard me mention it on the channel before. Um, Uh, yes, Ada, I, I agree that I agree with you that uh, a man might miss some of the aspects for a woman. That's very likely. Um, there's an old joke which um, uh, my wife and I refer to fairly often, which is if a man speaks in the woods and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? And the answer to that is yes, he is, because um, men see, I mean, if we talk about main, heterosexual men and heterosexual women, uh, then we would say that men um, don't see things the same way as a woman does. And not only do we not see it, we may not be able to see it. Because if you think of the yin-yang symbol uh, from the Chinese, those, the black and the white can't get together. Um, and so this is one of the big reasons why marriage developed, why, why there is even is marriage, because um, we're literally not whole if we don't have a spouse, um, because we cannot, men cannot see things the way women see them, and women cannot see things the way men see them, very typically. And so, um, so I would say, by all means, you, you should look to the women authors, very definitely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm glad you liked my joke because there's also uh, one, it turned out that um, years ago, uh, years ago I visited Arizona and um, I bought two of these mugs and the mug says, um, if a man speaks in a desert where no woman can hear him, is he still wrong? And uh, I actually have that in my goodie bag to give to Des when when the ice clears enough for her to come to a session, um, <clears throat> because that's been sort of a standing joke within our group for quite some time now. Um, and... Uh, Let's see, uh, what else? So anyway, um, how, how are my, I uh, hear Daniel. Ah. Uh, the various levels of individuation. Very good question. Well, actually, I'm addressing this in more detail in the ion readings, but let, let me share with you here uh, so that you can see it, and then uh, this, um, this graphic is available in Dr. Edinger's um, Ion Lectures, and it's, um, I'm just experimenting here with how far to hold it from the screen so that you can see this thing. Um, but in this, in this graphic, this is in the Ion Lectures from uh, Dr. Edinger, and at the lowest level, we have the self. And uh, that self is, as 
a personal manifestation as history, as world, and as space-time. And this is where this is where you find the God image or the transpersonal self. We could talk about that. Um, and that would be the deepest level. In fact, uh, Marie-Louise Van Frans, who was one of Dr. Jung's closest followers, um, and I'll see if I can, let's see, is there a way to, I haven't worked out all the tricks yet here, but so I don't know how to put on the live lecture an actual um, picture like this, but I, I will put it on the video of this session. And um, so above the self on this document is the anima and the animus. And so the, the God image, the self, the deepest archetype um, is ridden by the anima and the animus. And normally it's the anima in a man and the animus in a woman. And I guess I didn't finish my point about Marie-Louise von Franz. She wrote a book called uh, uh, something about fairy tales. And one of the comments, I've just gotten it, so I haven't really read all the way through the book yet, but one of the comments she did make in that book in the introduction is that there's only one archetype and that archetype is the self, the, the deepest level. And then what rides above that is the anima or the animus. So um, our self, our uh, personal God, uh, sees the world um, in the case of a man through the anima and in the case of a woman through the animus. And so, um, so in this image, uh, you see the anima and the animus. That's the syzygy. They're yoked together, and that's why I say you have to have both. And then above that is the ego, which is the first thing we experience, and uh, the main thing that we experience in our conscious life. And so the self is actually peering out at the world through into the ego through the animus and the anima. Okay, and so in Ion, the first, the way uh, Dr. Jung wrote the book and the way it was described by Dr. Edinger was um, that the first chapter is the ego. And um, the ego um, is the first thing that we're aware of and, and the thing that we're mostly aware of. The second chapter is the shadow. And so here in this image, you can see the shadow behind the ego going down into the self. And then the third thing is the anima and animus. That's the syzygy. Uh, as Dr. Young explains it and Dr. Edinger explained it. And then finally you get to the self. Now, beyond that, of course, Dr. Young um, surfaced many, many other archetypes. Um, Dr. Uh, Freud found one archetype. He found um, the Oedipus archetype. And that archetype is basically that if we had our druthers, we'd all like to return to the womb. Uh, it didn't doesn't mean that um, it doesn't mean that we want to make love with our mother. It means that once we, as adults, go out into the real world, we find things are kind of tough, <laughs> and and you know we'd love to have our mother come take care of us again the way she did when we were children. Unfortunately. Most of us don't have that option, and so we have to learn to be mature human beings. And so that's what uh, the Oedipus complex really is about. It's really about wanting to go back to the nuclear family and be safe and, and warm. And 
you know, we all feel that from time to time. Certainly, uh, it also works in the so-called electric complex. Um, but these are archetypal complexes that float around in our psyche, and some of us they, some of us feel them more than others. Uh, now, let me just see. Okay, so half dust, half deity asks me, what are your thoughts on Jordan Peterson? I only admire Jungian knowledge. I wonder why more of his followers haven't found you. Uh, well, I haven't gone out of my way to attract uh, Jordan's followers. They uh, have their certain agenda. and But um, I think Jordan Peterson is brilliant. He may be one of the most brilliant people on the planet. Uh, I think he should talk more about uh, Jungian psychology, especially outside the context of the, uh, the therapy session, outside of analysis, um, which is where I come to Jungian psychology from. I never had psychotherapy. Well, that's not true. I, I did go to five sessions of psychotherapy when my first marriage was breaking up. But um, aside from that, and that was not Jungian, and that was not a success. And it was not a success because the psychotherapist never gave us a sense of what was going on in our lives or why we should think about different things and so it was for me it was a waste of time looking back on it now I can wish that we had better psychotherapists um, but I don't think that's Jordan Peterson not, not at all in fact I uh, I think very highly of his intellect and I think that he's constrained somewhat because in an academic environment where he's the psychology professor, psychology professor, um, he has to talk about everybody's idea about psychology. But the problem with that is that uh, most psychologies in the world, it seems to me, are behavioral and, they're, and uh, are therefore very superficial. Um, and so you know, the healthcare system, at least in the United States, wants your psychologist or psychiatrist to give you some drugs and make you feel good and then go away, and they give them 10 minutes to do that. Um, you know, that's not, a, that's not a recipe for getting to the depth of your psyche and, and understanding how to live, but it might make you feel good and it might cast away depression, so it, it has its uses, but it's not depth psychology, let's put it that way. Um, and so let's see. Um, I have not read Jordan's uh, book, Maps of Meaning, but I uh, certainly have listened to several of his um, lectures on the Bible. Unfortunately, I haven't had the time to listen to all of them, but I just think he's brilliant and he's really doing us a service because um, as Bill and my group says, uh, a lot of Christian sects have weaponized God and they've been able to do that because they've taken a totally rational approach uh, to Christianity and that's, in the end, uh, it doesn't get us anywhere as a society. If, um, uh, well, once you have to rationalize it, then you get more and more splits in, in uh, religion. And therefore, you have the Reformation, and then you have the Calvinists, and then you have the Methodists, and then you have the Baptists, and then you have et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Apparently, there are more than 400 sects of Protestant Christianity. And 
they all have their specific little area of expertise, uh, but they've sort of missed the point, and the point isn't in the rational side of the house. So uh, let's see here. Well, why, uh, why didn't Jordan Peterson find me yet? Well, <laughs> uh, I think since he's had his great success, he's uh, far out there. Uh, he, he has so many people to talk to right now that he doesn't have a need for me. <laughs> so, you know, I suppose he will find me at some point in time and we'll have a nice chat. Um, because I do think very highly in, of what he's doing. Uh, he's trying to stay off the radical fringe, both on the left and the right, and I really respect him for what he's done there. Uh, and, and it's been very difficult and very threatening for him in many ways. And so, anyway, um, am I familiar with, the, with Gnostic and Jungian scholars Stephen Hel Stephen Heller, Stephen Heller. Uh, it so happens that in this book, um, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, um, there is an article by Stephen Heller. Heller, and that's not that one, but um, but in any case. Um, uh, here it is, Abraxas Gnostic. So here it is. Um, and it's called uh, Abraxas Jung's Gnostic Demiurge in Liber Novus. And um, so I have read that. I think it's an excellent article. Um, the critical thing, I think, about this is that the Gnostics uh, believed in experience. And um, the experiential side of Christianity was um, made, was considered heretical from about the fourth century, and so the problem is that if you do everything on the rational side, um, you slice and dice Christianity very well, right down to the point where God is dead, but you get entirely away from the religious experience. And uh, that ends up being the point of Jungian psychology, um, which I didn't even realize until I read Edward Edinger's, um, Edward Edinger's uh, lecture on this. There's a couple of lectures on my um, website. I have a website which you may or may not know about, so I'll just give you the link. Um, and um, it's called archetypeinaction.com. I've been curating that website now for about um, eight years, seven years, more than seven years. And on that website, if you click on the title of any article, you will get a bunch of tabs on the right side of the uh, website and in the first group of tabs uh, you will find um, you will find group Edinger and God as tabs and then in that I have put transcripts of two lectures by Edward Edinger and I'm going to give you the links to those now um, and so one of them is this one, uh, and I, I can't presume to tell you everything about that lecture right now because it's an hour and a half lecture. And then there's another one, en Encounters with the Greater Personality. But I thought, actually, I listened to both of these lectures. They're just audio. Uh, multiple times, um, probably ten times each, and I just could not grok it. I just could not. 
And so finally I just sat down and I transcribed, transcribed both lectures. So I've given you the links to both of those lectures. And what Edinger says in those lectures is that the objective of Jungian analysis is to get you to have this experience with the self, with the God image, with the transpersonal self. And if you have that experience, then it doesn't, no creed matters. It doesn't matter um, about Christianity or Buddhism or what have you. And so I think those two lectures are very important to understand what we're talking about. And then going back to Gnosticism then, Gnosticism was a way of thinking about the life of Christ and Christianity, which was based on experience. And obviously, Dr. Jung um, thought highly of that. He thought, he thought that, um, that Jung, he thought that the Gnostics were not fully developed. They've been very put upon by the church, and most of what they said um, that we know about was uh, from uh, their enemies, the church. And so we don't really know too much about them. Uh, but, you know, obviously when the Nag Hammadi Library was discovered in Egypt and became available, then lots of things happen, including Stephen Heller wrote several books about Gnosticism and the Gnostic Jung and so on. Um, and, you know, that's giving us bits and pieces, but I don't think it was, I don't think that the Jungian analysts have really talked about what the societal implications are of a Christianity that's revivified based on experience, where uh, now that we don't have um, the Inquisition anymore, now some of us can talk about this uh, without getting burned at the stake. And Dr. Jung was very aware that if he had been born in an earlier century, he would have been burned at the stake. Um, Uh, okay, Local Mo asks a very good question, which is, he says that I've been doing some reading on active imagination. It is often described as a dangerous undertaking. Do you agree with this? Um, I, I somewhat agree, okay, but I also want to emphasize that it is a very important tool. And... You know, Dr. Edinger did a book about Moby Dick, and one of the things he said in one of these two lectures is, um, you know, Jungian psychology is somewhat like Christianity in that all the followers of Christ were fishermen, and they fished things up out of the deep. And, and so when you pull up a fish, if the fish is uh, too big for your boat, then you better cut your line and not try to pull the fish into the boat. This is what Captain Ahab did not do and therefore uh, went to perdition. Um, but, and so the point is, I think of myself as a hermetic type, uh, as uh, Mercury, you know, Hermes. And as such, I bring things from the depths, from the deep unconscious. And if you find something that's too big for your ego, your boat is your ego in this case, your, excuse me, your, your ego is floating on the surface of your psyche and you need an, an ego that's big enough to handle what you pull up, very frankly. And, for example, I've talked a few times about my, um, my confrontation with the unconscious, which 
occurred in 1993. And at the time I had no, I had no one to help me. I didn't know anything about psychology really or not very much. I had started my studies of Jungian psychology at that time, but uh, at very rudimentary levels. And and it is true that if you start talking about these archetypal matters, you can have an experience. It can cause an experience. And that happened in my case because I was reading um, Clarissa Pinkolastis' book, Women Who Run With the Wolves, and I decided to write a novel. And within a couple of days of starting that novel, suddenly I was having this psychogenic experience and it lasted for eight months, and basically it wrote the novel. Um, I literally had an entity um, who's the heroine of this novel uh, waking me up every morning at six o'clock and not letting me stop writing until I'd written 500 to 1,000 words for eight months. And I would simply go to my uh, computer turn the screen down as low as I could possibly get it so it wouldn't wake me up into my conscious mind put my hands on the keys and the novel wrote itself and so all the images that came up in that novel came through me I channeled them but I did not write that book consciously and I think that and it wasn't until the, until 2009 when I read, um, when I first got a copy of the Red Book, that I realized that this is basically the type of thing that was happening to Jung. Now, he had better control of it because he was a psychiatrist and he knew what these things were <laughs> that were going on, and so he was able to control it. But at some level, he does recount times during that process when he thought he was going into a psychosis. And so, um, so active imagination, that is active imagination, um, and, uh, and it can be very powerful. Um, but if, if there's anything going on in your psyche that maybe is bigger than you are, uh, don't pull it into your boat. Cut the line loose and maybe get some professional help if that happens. Um, but if your ego is big enough, you can handle it. And so today, knowing what I know about this experience, uh, yes, I could handle it probably. Um, but I... Uh, I did one act of imagination with another person for about 10 months. And the way we did it, it was a tandem act of imagination where I would put an imagination onto a story and then she would put an imagination onto the story following it. And so I would send something then the deal was that if we ever stopped for whatever reason, we couldn't ask questions about why we stopped and uh, we would never speak of it again. And so there was this exchange back and forth and you know we literally wrote a book, a pretty thick book, um, back and forth, each elaborating on the anatomy uh, each elaborating on the imagination of the other. Um, and it, we went extremely deep during that act of imagination, that tandem act of, act of imagination. Uh, at the end of it, uh, this must have been in about 1992 or so, uh, we got to a place that I was not ready for. And so it was me that didn't, that stopped it. Um, and um, I talked to her a couple of years later. Um, and, you know, we were not 
physical friends in the regular world at all. Um, but I, I did have a communication with her a couple of years later, and she said she had a printout of this time, and she considered it precious, and she kept it in her desk. Well, I, I consider the experience precious also. Um, but um, I do acknowledge that I got to a point in that act of imagination that went on for 10 months where I got to a place that I was no longer comfortable. And I just naturally stopped it. I didn't want to, I didn't feel comfortable with where I was at that point. And so I decided to withdraw from it. Um, and so I basically followed Dr. Edinger's advice, which is if you pull up a fish that's bigger than your boat, you better cut the line. Um, but, you know, I think that if you read up on active imagination, you can give it a try and um, just know that if you get into an area that is too deep, um, pull yourself back from it. And the other thing is to keep yourself in touch with the real world. Um, and that's very important. That's a techni technique that Dr. Young himself was using, and he talks about it uh, in his later writing, where he said when these events were going on from the Red Book, he had to keep reminding himself um, I'm a medical doctor, I have patients that rely on me, I have a wife and five children and they all rely on me. I live at 228 Seistrasse in Kusnacht. And so he kept reminding himself of him, he kept reminding himself of himself in the physical world. Um, and that gave him sort of the safety line that he needed. And uh, in, in my case, I, I didn't really realize that that's what was going on with me because I wasn't a uh, psychological professional at all at that time and not very knowledgeable about it. So I just thought I was writing a novel. And so I went on, oh, just went ahead with my everyday, everyday life, and uh, I didn't um, go crazy. I mean, I, I was forced myself, my, um, my entity forced me to write the novel to the end. Uh, there was no stopping it. It was an archetypal thing that once it started, it had to play out. And that's the way archetypes are. Once they start to play, um, they're not going to stop until they're done. It's like a, it's like a record, or it's like the DNA. And so archetypes are like that. And I'm sure every woman that's watching this, that's a mother, knows that once you're a mother, you're a mother, and you have it. You have no choice about it. You're going to behave like a mother, and and there's no backing out of it either. And so every archetype is like that. It's like the warrior archetype for a man. I was, um, during the Vietnam War, I joined the U.S. Marine Corps. And, you know, I became a warrior. And um, I played that archetype through entirely. I finally retired from the Marine Corps as a lieutenant colonel. So, um, there was no stopping that archetype for me. Um, and that archetype was probably constellated when I was born because my father was a naval officer who went to the U.S. Naval Academy. And so I've been affiliated with the U.S. military all of my life. I still carry an ID card because I'm retired. So anyway, okay. Okay, thought, this is a good question, Daniel. Do I have any thoughts about psych psychedelic substances in, a rate in relation to Jungian insights, archetypal elements of the psyche during tripping, and deeper dynamics of the personality? Okay, my thought is don't do it. And, uh, 
using uh, psycho psychedelic substances is really bad idea for all kinds of health reasons. And so, yes, uh, you know, if you use psychedelic substances or if you drink a lot of liquor, you can start having hallucinations. I mean, on television lately, we're seeing these um, ads for some sort of drug. I don't remember what it is, but it's for Parkinson's disease. And they're talking about the fact that people with Parkinson's disease can have illusions or delusions. And I'm sure that's true. And so they're using that drug to control those illusions or uh, delusions. Um, and, you know, but if you lose control of these things, then they're going to own you. And so I don't think it's a good idea to use psychologic, psychedelic substances. You know, there are plenty of ways to get into your unconscious uh, without using um, marijuana or alcohol or psychedelic drugs. Um, you know, I remember my grandfather, who was an alcoholic, having visions of some sort. Uh, I don't clearly remember what they were, but I do remember him having them, and, and it's not good. Um, and, you know, he had a stroke when he was 58 and died when he was 68. Um, so it's not, it's not something that is worth tripping about, okay, because it's a trip you may not come back from. Um, so anyway, that's my view about that. Okay, so um, okay, so half dust, half deity uh, is talking about art and the creative unconscious, and um, yes, I think that art is a way, and probably is the best way. I mean, we've been talking about the artificial ways to get to your unconscious, but. Um, you know, I was always a, a rational type of guy. I mean, I grew up in the military. Everything's, yes, sir, do it this way. And uh, when I got out of active duty, I went to law school. I practiced law. And so I was doing everything on the rational side. But at some point, I mean, shortly after my experience in the writing of the novel, um, <clears throat> shortly after that experience, I had the urge to paint, and I started to paint, and uh, I enjoyed it very much. I was passable at it. You can see some examples of it if you're if you're not a member of our Dropbox, you can join our Dropbox by simply sending me your email address to skip.conover at gmail.com. That's skip.conover at gmail.com, and I will add you to our Dropbox. In our Dropbox are some of my paintings. Uh, many of those paintings have erotic content, as does my novel, and so I consider those parts of myself that are in my shadow. They um, are parts of myself that give me psychic energy. Um, but I know their place. <laughs> and, and so um, if you look at those things, you shouldn't um, 
think that I'm some sort of wacko or something like that. I think that all of us have erotic thoughts. And certainly when I started to paint, I was doing a lot of painting where I was just doing uh, scenes. And um, uh, so, for example, I probably did more than 600 paintings uh, when I was walking my dogs and I would carry a set of um, watercolors on my back. And every morning at 6 a.m. I would paint the sunrise, which would be different every day. And so I painted a new painting in 15 minutes every day. It was a, it was a watercolor. Some of them were terrible, but um, some of them turned out to be quite numinous. And um, I think, for example, of one that I did in a, on a day that it was just sort of like a foggy rain, and I put the, I put, you know, this sort of dark color down on the canvas, and then the little drops of rain just came in just right to give the same impression. It was just perfect. Um, but these, these, you know, a lot of erotica uh, did come up while I was uh, doing that painting, but it doesn't mean you have to do that kind of painting in order to get that experience, because my mother-in-law got into these adult coloring books, and I'm sure a lot of people think that those are just ridiculous, um, but I, my wife gave me a set of 24 uh, pencils, colored pencils for Christmas one year, and an adult coloring book, and I sat down with I think I had a mandala that I was filling in the colors on. And um, the way I did it was I had this 24 pencil spread out and I just let my hand go across the uh, group of pencils and I would just let my instinct pick the color that I would put into the next um, space on the adult coloring book. And I did that for about a, an hour. And suddenly, I just burst into tears. I had just sobbing tears. And so obviously, I touched something that was very deep in myself. And it was only by using an adult coloring book. It wasn't anything special. And, and yet, that was, I was using creativity to select those uh, colors and put them into the spaces. And so, you know, that's a way to break through to the unconscious, too. And any sort of artistic activity is going to do that. It doesn't, it's not going to happen on the rational side. It happens from the, from the emotional side. Um, Can I make a distinction between an internal and an external hero's journey? And if so, do they have different utilities? Uh, well, let's, let's talk about the external hero's journey first. Uh, okay, I grew up in the military. The Vietnam War was on. Um, I was... Uh, I certainly didn't want to go to Vietnam, but I was um, sort of taken away by it. I spent every early evening during my college years watching um, Walter Cronkite on television and watching the news from Vietnam, somehow at some depth, knowing that one day I would go there. And so I felt it was my duty, um, you know, consciously, it was my ego duty. I went and joined the Marine Corps. I became a second lieutenant, all that stuff. Okay, well, that's at the very external level, okay? And, yeah, there's some internal aspects of it. It, it is affiliated with the warrior archetype, but it was on a very archetypal level. The hero's journey internally is much more difficult. 
and it's a question of finally getting to know yourself and understanding what Dr. Young's dictum was that it's yourself that's driving you it's not you driving it and and so why am I doing this why am I even in this conversation right now well um, because I'm driven I'm possessed um, and at some level I believe that well certainly it gives meaning to my life and at some level I believe that I was born to do exactly this and there are a couple, couple of other aspects of my life that are similar in that respect but certainly this is one of the main ones and so I think of it as Michelangelo chipping away at the at the statue of David you know David was always in there in that huge block of uh, marble and um, that block of marble sat next to a cathedral for, 30, uh, for 54 years two other sculptors had made a start on that block and then they gave up and Michelangelo worked on it chipping away at it for four years and ultimately um, the statue of David um, emerged from it and but it was always there and so we're like that the meaning of our life is like that it's in the block of marble and the question is all the experiences in life are the chips that chip away at it until finally yourself emerges and so if you think about it in that way then you're going to understand the hero's journey in the internal way and you can have guidance from Dr. Jung on that there's lots of it there's 20 volumes of it I couldn't talk about it here but um, anyway um, that I guess that's all I have to say about that for the time being can't have an inner adventure without an outer adventure yes I agree with that the outer adventure um, is the sculpture um, chipping away at your block of marble that I, that's exact I agree with that entirely um, Yeah, I, um, there's been a couple of mentions on this conversation about the Blake book on um, the encounter with the self, the, the one that has um, the William Blake plates from the Job archetype. And that's a really terrific book. I really highly urge you to get a copy. Um, it was out of print about a year ago and I wanted to get a copy and I ended up having to buy a used one for $57 but then um, I found out that the um, the Young Bookstore at the Young Institute in LA the Los Angeles um, Friends of Young Bookstore which has a very complete collection sells that book for $12 and so I urge you to buy it there or you might be able to get it from inner city books. I'm not sure about that. Um, so, um, so I, I'm having this idea that I might do a reading for the President of the United States since I've run out of questions for the time being and so you can stay around for that or not <laughs> um, or at least I'll start. My, my wife gave me a new set of tarot cards which is the um, 
the Wild Unknown Tarot, tarot set. And so um, I'm going to try to use those and I'll do a Celtic cross for what's going to happen with the President of the United States in the coming week. So uh, we won't consider this a, um, a projection or uh, a prediction because I'm not that good of a tarot reader to predict as yet, but I thought you might be interested in this. So I'm going to just uh, mix up my tarot deck a little bit and um, I'm going to draw cards until I get the first, um, until I get the first uh, major arcana, and that will be the significator for the reading. So I got the Four of Cups reversed. I got the um, I got Judgment. So, and judgment is reversed. So that is the significator for this reading. And this is how the president is feeling, which is uh, the five of wands reversed. Okay, so I'm sorry, let me, um, let me first show you these cards. Okay, so here's the judgment card. And it was reversed, so it's upside down. And um, and this is the Five of Wands. Um, and so the president got the Five of Wands as a um, reversed, so he feels he's in a desperate uh, battle. The, the Five of Wands in the Rider weight deck is a jolly thing where there's five guys and they're all like playing with poogle sticks and they're they're just whacking away with one another like Friar Tuck and Robin Hood but reverse that would be a that wouldn't be a game anymore so the president doesn't feel he's in a game anymore and what is crossing him is temperance um, and so I have to say that that sounds pretty accurate uh, because I, I haven't seen any signs of temperance from the President of the United States. And what is above him is the Mother of Wands reversed, and this is the Mother of Wands. So the Mother of Wands is reversed, meaning that that um, the nature, power nature, is not working out for him. And what's below him is the death card reversed. <laughs> and there's the card. And so the death card reversed would suggest that there's change coming and it's under him so maybe that it's not a very positive change coming from his perspective okay what's behind him is the daughter of swords reversed so here's the daughter of swords but she is reversed and so um you know who knows you name your poison about what that means. Obviously, um, I think that his daughter has been um, supporting him quite a lot, but um, maybe her advice hasn't been the best. And what's before him is um, the Six of Cups. So the Six of Cups is norm normally a positive uh, card and it suggests that um, because it's a tree and it suggests the tree of life and so on it suggests that through all these difficulties that he's going through that he may indeed be developing a stronger ego um, 
my perception of him is that he hasn't had a very strong ego up to now because he hasn't been denied enough. And that's one of the teachings that we've had from Jungian psychology, which is the Job archetype, which is contest, defeat, lamentation, and rebirth. And the way you build a strong ego is to contest often to lose, to lament about the loss, uh, and then to move on, to be reborn into something else. But when you are, when you move on to something else, it means that your ego gets stronger. And so, in this case, with this card being in his future, it may well be that all of these losses and hardships that he's having in his administration may be building building up enough of a strong ego so that he can survive. That may well be. Um, and um, the card I got for where he is right now is the Wheel of Fortune reversed. The Wheel of Fortune reversed. Now the Wheel of Fortune is suggests that um, the one is on a cyclical um, situation and that you either have to take the learning out of it and step out of the cycle or if you fail to take the learning out of it you're going to drop back into the into the cycle and go around again and in his case he's it's reversed so that suggests um, <clears throat> that suggests that he's going back um, uh, into another cycle. And they want, um, he gets the Hierophant reversed. So that would, uh, the Hierophant suggests, um, suggests conventional wisdom and It appears that they want, that could be interpreted as the people of the United States or the people of the world for that matter because his activities affect everyone. Um, a lot of people um, want him to fail and uh, I don't know if that's good for the country, um, honestly. Uh, so that's that's troublesome. He wants um, he wants to be the father of wands, but it turned out that it came up as the father of wands reversed. So the father of wands means he w would mean that he wants to have all the power, but a reversed father of wands would suggest that he wants a dark side of the power. Um, and that's that's a serious question, um, and the, what he gets is the Eight of Swords, and the Eight of Swords is um, not a very good card to get, and um, <clears throat> I will in in the Rider Waite deck. The Eight of Swords is a very negative car, but um, since, let me, um, I, I just want to take the Wild and Known Tarot book and just read the Eight of Swords, and here it is. Um, and this was right side up, so this is his reading, what he gets. Surrounded by obstacles and threats on all sides, you find yourself the victim. You see no way out, no available choices. Your, your perceptions keep you from well, <clears throat> your perceptions keep you from opening your wings and taking flight. So that suggests that he sees himself in this chrysalis, maybe. Um, and so, what keeps you suspended here, or the question? There's a question: What keeps you suspended here, yourself or others? The Eight of Swords demands an answer you cannot hang, 
you cannot hang here much longer. And so that's what he gets. He can't hang here much longer. I think a lot of us would agree with that. Um, but anyway, for what it's worth, a tarot reading uh, is simply a way to kick over the furniture in your unconscious. And it only means what was there now. Uh, you should know, and so you can always change a tarot reading um, after it, it, it sort of falls away after the event. And obviously you should read uh, a personal bias of mine that I am a Democrat and I wouldn't have voted for this man on a bet. Um, in fact, I've said that I wouldn't vote for another Republican for the rest of my life, even if you put a gun to my head, but I have deep-seated reasons for that. Um, but in terms of what this reading says to me, I think it's very profound. Um, and, um, and so what a reading does, it's going to mean something different to every one of you who's listened to it. And what it does is it either connect <coughs> It connects with things in your psyche or not. And if it does connect with things in your psyche, then it may move the furniture around in your psyche. If it doesn't, you'll just forget it. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, I will uh, take a picture. I'm going to put it out on a, on a beige table so that I can, <laughs> so that the reading will show up and then I'll take a photograph of it. So uh, there will be a photograph of this um, of this reading um, with the video. Uh, I'm assuming that this video is going to come up fine on the uh, YouTube channel. And so when it does, um, I, will, um, I will keep it public and I'll try. I'm not sure I know how to add the reading, but um, I will do my best to both add this reading and the, uh, the uh, figure from Edinger's book that I was showing you earlier in our discussion. Uh, can I do a blob reading for viewers? Um, <clears throat> I think I'm, I may be read out for today. Um, and um, so I, uh, this, uh, the user that asked for this blob reading is referring to uh, a boast of mine, which was that um, I could go into a room with a thousand people, throw the cards across the uh, stage, uh, and read from them without putting them in a specific place, and everyone would think there was a reading for them. Um, yes, I can do that. Um, and the reason that that works is that everybody, these are archetypal images, everybody's got some sort of archetypal thing going on in their unconscious, and so any reading is going to connect to everybody. Uh, it, everybody hears a different reading, but everybody will connect to the reading, and then things happen after that, for better or for worse. Uh, could I elaborate a bit on Jung's writings on Pleroma and Cretora? Uh, particularly in the Seven Sermons of the Dead, particularly what Pleroma and Cretora is and their relationship to each other. Um, I don't think I'm the best person for this. Um, my group member, Bill, has a PhD in philosophy, and uh, he talks about the Pleroma quite a bit, and he actually asked for uh, permission to do a report on uh, the seven sermons uh, for one of our group sessions. So I think that I should defer to Bill on that for the time being. Um, 
and um, <clears throat> you know, just generally, I could say that the pleroma is the deep background of everything. Okay, it's where we all come from, and where everything comes from. And so, um, Dr. Jung once said that if everything were destroyed, uh, it would all begin again. And that's because it's all in the pleroma to begin with. Um, you know, you could think of um, well, we'd have to go through the um, 15 syzygies of the Gnostics uh, and you can actually find that discussion um, in one of um, Dr. Edinger's preliminary statements about ion. And so I've, uh, I, let's see if I can find it quickly. Um, Okay, so I'm pretty sure it's in the Ion Lectures, and it is um, it is on page 18 of the Ion Lectures uh, at the end of um, Dr. Edinger's introduction to this book. Uh, that's page 18, and it, um, yeah, I think I should refer you to that. Uh, the Creatora is everything that came out of the Pleroma. It's, um, you could say it's the creatures, but it's really everything the planets, the stars, you name it. Um, and so I don't think I've given you a definitive answer on this because I'm sort of vague about it myself, but I will address this in group maybe as soon as Monday night. Uh, uh, would I consider a review of this reading um, next month. I, if you are a, a Tarot reader, I'd be happy if you want to do it. You could send me a note. And um, I, I have a comment in, in here in Russian. Uh, let's see if I can get a translation of it. I, I'm reluctant to prove comments that are not in English without knowing what what they are, but I may be able to get a, a, um, a translation from Google, and if it's okay, I will approve it. Uh, and um, I'm asked by Great Moments of Opera, have I ever read what Soho said about Jung? And the answer to that is no. And, and hello, <laughs> but I, I have no idea what Soho may have said about Dr. Young. Uh, if you want to enlighten me, I'll be happy to hear it. <laughs> um, I, I think that um, I think that a great moments here is talking about a a, per, a mystical person who. Uh, Maybe Indian. I'm, I'm not sure what the nationality is. Okay, so here comes my Google Translate. Let's just see. Oh, uh, Okay, Dr. Jung refused to meet a fully realized man in India when he was there. Um, I do have a book that someone gave me at one point about his trip um, to India. And uh, so 
this um, this comment that came across in Russian. Uh, I'm sorry to say I'm going to decline. It's uh, it's uh, defamatory, and so there you are. I'm not going to include it. And let's see. Um, And, yeah, I don't doubt that he was offered the opportunity to meet a fully realized man. And I, I doubt very much that Dr. Jung had a very thorough uh, knowledge of the Indian culture. Um, he was only there for six weeks. And I have been there uh, 44 times. Believe it or not, I've been to India 44 times since 1994. And I've probably spent at least uh, two years there in total in my lifetime in very many and very diverse situations. And to think that in six weeks Dr. Jung would have a very comprehensive knowledge of Indian culture um, is, I, can't, I cannot imagine it, honestly. Um, he did have enough of a knowledge of it so that he basically understood the basic tenets of um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, etc. Um, but he mostly focused on uh, the Western world. And, you know, I have a... Um, an antique copy of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is translated into English and has his um, foreword in it or his preface in it. And, it, and that's quite good. I mean, uh, in terms of talking about Buddhist philosophy and um, Suzuki, uh, the great Zen master, had him write an introduction to his book. Um, and also, um, who else? Oh, well, of course, um, The Secret of the Golden Flower, uh, which he wrote uh, for um, the German Sinologist, um, whose name just slipped my mind for the moment. Um, Rich, I'm sorry, it's Richard Wilhelm. Uh, Richard Wil Wilhelm brought back his personal translation of, of uh, the I Ching, and Dr. Jung wrote a foreword to it uh, called The Secret of the Golden Flower, and that book is credited with attracting Dr. Jung's attention uh, to uh, alchemy, uh, and because he saw that there was uh, a um, correspondence between Taoism and I Ching, and alchemy. And, you know, so the, this is a very long story. Three, three volumes of the collected works are on this topic, so I can't really address this uh, in detail uh, right now. Um, but in terms of India and um, and him not wanting to meet a realized person. I, I really don't know what was up there, but I, I don't think he had a very good idea of it. Well, um, okay, so Great Moment says that Soho basically thought that Jung had many fears and neuroses, despite all his wisdom, and was too intellectually focused fearful of death and fearful of true awakening. Uh, that may have been true, and um, it may have certainly been true at the time he was India, in India. Remember, he went to India in 1936 or 1937, and uh, he really didn't have his own true awakening. Uh, until his near-death experience in 1944. So I'm not sh exactly sure 
when Soho would have met him. Um, oh, uh, Osho, not Soho. Okay, Osho. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure when uh, Osho would have met him. Um, but if it was before 1944, that was definitely true. Would I recommend a good book on shadow work? I think there is a book, uh, and it may be by James Hillman, called The Shadow. Um, anyway, there is a book on, um, I think it's called The Shadow, which you can probably find on, on um, um, on Amazon. Uh, Jonathan Cabrera, have you ever looked into the Hermetic Principles? I'm reminded of how one of those principles states that everything corresponds at a certain level as above so below. I notice correspondences in many different ide ideologies. Uh, that's certainly true and that concept was certainly uh, part of Dr. Jung's oeuvre. And um, this card from the Tarot, um, which is the Six of Cups, uh, definitely relates that because we have as above, so below. Uh, nothing can grow to heaven unless it's well rooted in the soil of earth. And so that concept goes all through Everything. I mean, this is a this is a tarot deck. <laughs> not e not even cl claiming to be any specific philosophy per se, but yes, I agree that that's very broadly thought. Um, Mitch, you ask about how influential was Kant on Jung's work. Uh, I am not an expert in Kant. What I read says that he was heavily influenced by Kant. Um, but from my own knowledge, I can't directly say that. And I may put that question to Bill on Monday night and see if he has any uh, further input on it. Uh, well, this is... <laughs> my wife has just re returned home, so um, uh, that was probably the moment for me to discontinue this live feed. Uh, I've been thinking of doing uh, more tarot readings on live. Um, and uh, if you have any comments on that, I'd welcome them. Um, and uh, they would be probably blob readings if you want an individual reading. Um, I'm not a professional tarot reader, but within certain limits, I'm prepared to give individual readings, but that would have to be on Skype or something like that. Um, I've learned my lesson about doing it uh, in public for people. Um, but I, I can do blob readings, gen general readings, or readings for public figures or something like that. Um, so anyway, Okay, I am going to um, be the uh, moderator here and uh, say good night to everyone and thank you for participating in this live feed. I'll do it again sometime soon. Um, I wanted to do it during a couple hour period when I knew my wife was going to be out of the house so that I wouldn't disturb her life. and. Um, uh, so now that she's home, I think I should discontinue for today, but this seems to be have been a successful uh, venture for me because I, we've had as many as 13 people watching and considering I made no announcement about it or anything else, uh, this is very positive from my point of view. <clears throat> and as Dave Garraway used to say at the end of his programs, peace.